Welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Moore, Director of Google Earth and the Google Earth Outreach Team. On behalf of my colleagues here, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our event today, discussing some of the innovative ways that leading organizations and new data sources are coming together to unlock greater city ambition in tackling the climate crisis. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a very timely event exploring how data can help transform our intentions into informed data-driven actions for a sustainable future that we all want. At Google, environmental sustainability is something we've been passionate about and committed to since our founding. Within our GEO organization, for more than a decade, we've been focused on developing tools, technology, data, and partnerships to address global environmental issues with locally actionable data in order to drive real-world outcomes such as reducing deforestation, improving access to clean air and clean water, accelerating adoption of rooftop solar, and restoring sustainable fisheries around the world. 24 months ago, we stepped up our own ambition in the climate arena, recognizing the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to dramatically reduce the world's carbon emissions. We formed a foundational partnership with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, and together we looked at the needs of 10,000 cities who've taken a climate action pledge. We started by analyzing Google's comprehensive global mapping data, together with standard greenhouse gas emission factors, to estimate the carbon footprint of cities, including buildings and transportation emissions, as well as solar energy potential. Together with GCOM, we launched the Environmental Insights Explorer in our first pilot cities in 2018. The world was very different then. What's unfolded since has been one of the world's largest public health and economic crises of our time. And as we sit here today, we're also seeing havoc and destruction exacerbated by climate change impacting cities, countries, fragile ecosystems, with wildfires in some locations making air quality the worst it's ever been, while sheltering in place in others has revealed the cleaner air possible with reduced transportation. We're reminded of how interconnected our world is and how fragile the health of our planet is. While this seems like an impossible challenge, we've seen firsthand how this crisis is igniting a global community of innovators creating and adopting new technology to help lead the world to a more sustainable place. Two weeks ago, we laid out a plan for our most ambitious decade of action across Google. We're expanding Environmental Insights Explorer to help hundreds of cities reduce a gigaton of carbon emissions, a billion metric tons annually by 2030 and beyond. We're providing $4 million in funding to nonprofits to fund bold ideas to make progress towards a greener, more resilient future. And we're investing in tools and technologies to help everyone live more sustainable lives. We applaud already the wonderful work done by civic leaders and communities around the world and want to help you to do more. To the cities and organizations that are leading the charge, to the innovative organizations on the ground, helping to accelerate actions to solutions and make this decade of action the most ambitious yet. We're confident that we can meet this challenge together. Today's roundtable is a tremendous opportunity to bring thought leaders and action takers together to exchange ideas and accelerate our progress. Together with the Global Covenant of Mayors, we're excited to dive into discussion with city leaders around some of the ways cities and organizations are embracing technology in this fight against climate change and using it as an important resource in the global green recovery. We hope you enjoy the roundtable. And now I'd like to turn it over to Antha Williams, Global Head of Climate and Environment Programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies, for additional remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. I continue to be inspired by all that you're doing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Antha Williams. I'm the Head of Global Climate and Environment Programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies where we work to fight climate change and improve lives all around the globe. 
For the better part of a decade, Bloomberg Philanthropies has been investing in city climate leadership through initiatives like the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge, CDP Cities, and many more. But it's increasingly clear that no single organization or sector or government is going to be able to solve the climate challenge alone. And that's why our climate and environment programs work to create partnerships between cities, businesses, public health and environmental advocates, researchers, and many others to get to the scale of solution that we need to solve these pressing problems. The topic of today's discussion is unlocking city ambition, data, insights, and innovation to combat climate change. At Bloomberg Philanthropies, we're big believers in the power of cities and in the power of data. And we have a saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, and so when we started doing climate work in cities, it was really clear that in order for mayors to take action, they needed to first have the data and information on where they stood. And through the Global Covenant of Mayors, we provided thousands of cities with the information that they needed to get started on their transition to a low carbon economy. But this year marks an inflection point. We need to stop spending so much time collecting data and reporting it, and more time taking the strong action that science says is required to cut emissions by 50% in just the next 10 years and avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Innovation and partnerships among the public sector, the private sector, and philanthropy are gonna be really critical to achieving that future vision. And that's why we're so excited about this work between Bloomberg Philanthropies, Google, and the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Google's tools are helping automate um, cities view of their emissions so that they can see where emissions are coming from and inform their policy making decisions. Data for the Environmental Insights Explorer or EIE is now available to 3000 cities and we're working to make this tool even more expansive and accessible. For example, the city of Copenhagen, for the first time, now has localized pollution data that's allowed them to identify sources of pollution and inform a recent policy to limit private car use and cut pollution um, and increase pedestrian traffic uh, in the medieval center of the city. And this is the type of future policymaking and vision that we want to achieve. Making proprietary data and technologies available for the public benefit can help better direct our climate investments and inform climate policymaking um, and help accelerate the world's transition to a low carbon economy. Before passing it over to our panelists, I really want to acknowledge that it's an incredibly tough time right now. The COVID-19 pandemic, the social and economic uncertainty and unrest, and the climate-fueled catastrophes that are literally killing people have all caused major disruptions to city climate work. I'm impressed and inspired by how mayors and cities, including the example in Copenhagen, have been able to keep this work on track. Today, we'll discover some of the key challenges to accessing data for, that's useful for decision-making. And we'll also discuss how we can scale this information to more cities, especially those in the global south that are feeling the worst impacts of climate change today. I'd like to now introduce you to Amanda Eichel, who's the Executive Director of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. She'll moderate today's panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antha, uh, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. I'm pleased to be here representing the Global Covenant of Mayors, which is a coalition of 10,000 mayors globally uh, who have all made a significant commitment to climate as well as increased access to clean and affordable energy. Um, and it really, at this time, when cities are being hit hard by the global pandemic, uh, it's important to also recognize that they have not lost sight of the climate emergency. So I'm really glad to be joined by a number of um, distinguished leaders today, both from city governments where we work, uh, but also from Google, uh, one of the most significant partnerships that, that the Global Covenant of Mayors has established to help support cities around the world. At the Global Covenant of Mayors, we focus on 
uh, delivery of three specific resources. Often the, the resource of finance is considered the most important for cities, but we know that equally important are access to good, reliable data and innovation and research and technology. So today we'll be talking about the importance of data through that partnership between the Global Covenant and Google. Before we begin our discussion, I wanted to briefly introduce our panelists. So we're joined today by Mayor Don Iveson of Edmonton, Canada, who plays a prominent role in the Global Covenant of Mayors Innovate for Cities initiative, um, and who has always been a strong advocate for the importance of data and climate science, including hosting uh, the groundbreaking conference in 2018 that brought together cities, scientists, and the International Panel on Climate Change. Thanks for joining us today, Don. Lord Mayor Eckhart Wurzner of Heidelberg, Germany is also joining us, one of the earliest advocates of cities and climate action, starting as a leader in the European Covenant of Mayors and then joining us on the board of the Global Covenant of Mayors. Heidelberg was the first German city to adopt a municipal climate protection program back in 1992 and now aims to be carbon uh, neutral. Welcome, Mayor Wurzner. And Nithya uh, Sauri Rajan, uh, who is um, serving as Google's uh, director in Google's Geo for Everyone team, uh, the organization at Google that is working to catalyze social and environmental impact at scale. Her team is responsible for bringing the best in class geospatial data and insights that improve the lives of cities and citizens globally. Welcome, Nithya. Great, so we'll start with um, a question to Don. Uh, can you tell us about how your city of Edmonton is uh, working to incorporate real-time uh, decision-making into your day-to-day -day operations? Well, the city's been a leader in uh, open data and open government. Uh, we've been Canada's most open city for many years running. Recently uh, received platinum certification from the World Council on City Data. And we have, uh, I think at last count, well over 1,700 data sets and visual visualizations that we uh, share with our public. And we also work with our public through hackathons and other events to determine what are the data sets that they would find interesting. Uh, uh, and that helps us understand our blind spots as an organization and, and perhaps get data sets mashed up that we wouldn't think uh, of. And that's led to um, a variety of different opportunities for us to optimize our operations, which obviously supports cost effectiveness and better service delivery to citizens. But very often it also results uh, in efficiency gains in terms of emissions reductions. And so we see the use of open data uh, and all of our dashboards and all of our data sets and all of our visualizations, not just as tools for our own decision makers, uh, both um, uh, our technical experts and our elected officials, but also for our public uh, to hold us to account. And so we be believe very strongly that there are uh, sort of fundamental democratic principles behind uh, the, uh, the use of open data. And that really contributes to, to our philosophy around open government and, and the many commitments that we've made as an organization over the years uh, to those principles. And we want to apply that much more aggressively to uh, notwithstanding COVID, the most significant uh, human challenge and technical challenge and nature-based challenge that we're all facing together. And so we wanted to uh, unite an effort that really began around municipal efficiency and around democratic transparency and really apply not just the city's in-house data analytics expertise, but really engage and enable our public uh, with tools that will help us understand what we need to do uh, to meet our ambitious goals to reduce our emissions consistent with uh, uh, Canada's goals and commitments under the Paris Agreement. Uh, and in fact, to go beyond that, we're looking closely right now at what it will take to get to uh, a carbon budget uh, for a 1.5 degree future. And that's no small uh, task for a city like ours with uh, one of the highest carbon footprints in, in Canada. Uh, but we are seeing reductions now. Uh, we're 5.6% uh, reduction in emissions per person in our most recent uh, data and a 26% reduction in energy use. So we're starting to make that turn. It's it's hard to do in a, in a northern city like this. 
Um, but this is a very smart, very technologically enabled uh, community with a great manufacturing base and technical base. And we want to use data to help that economic capacity shift to relevance in energy retrofits and transportation systems, uh, renewable energy adoption, all of the things that we know we need to scale up aggressively. Um, but we want to optimize that. Uh, and and uh, because we don't have time to make lots of mistakes and experiment endlessly. So uh, data is going to be one of the mechanisms by which first we determine what the best bets are in there and where we're going to place our incentives and where we're going to make our regulatory moves, but then also track our success uh, and, and demonstrate what works and share that back into networks like the Global Covenant of Mayors and the uh, Green Municipal Fund, which is our federal partnership between the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the uh, the federal government, which now has over a billion dollars to work with to enable municipal innovation around climate and energy. But for that to work, it really has to not just be experimentation, it has to be uh, reporting as well on our results. And this is where uh, the live use of data and sharing of best practices is going to be fundamental to tackling this challenge as a network of problem solvers. And we see ourselves, you know, we're we uh, so much of our traditional wealth came from oil and gas. And so we very much see ourselves as energy problem solvers. And I believe firmly that we need to be part of uh, the energy transition to stay economically relevant. And so whether it's uh, whether it's hydrogen or whether it's optimization of uh, traditional energy as, as we make the transition, uh, data has got to be part of it. It's got to be an evidence based conversation um, and open data helps us do that. Great, and maybe just a quick follow-up uh, question for you. You mentioned the Global Covenant of Mayors, but how do you see the experience of Edmonton translating to other cities outside of Canada or even within uh, your country? Well, Edmonton is a very uh, spread out city. It's a fairly new North American city. I mean, indigenous peoples have been on these territories uh, for for thousands of years, um, but substantially uh, the, the growth of the city was after the Second World War. And so it's a very car dependent uh, city. It has a strong industrial base. It has a lot of leaky buildings uh, built in the 1960s and 1970s and even up into the last couple of decades, building codes were uh, energy was cheap and, and there were no externalities. And so we've got a massive, massive building retrofit program to do. We've got a huge shift to make in terms of our transportation systems. And so we're at the, again, and you see it in our per capita numbers, which again, they're tracking in the right direction, but we're starting from a very, very high number that we need to bring down. So we can template things that will be applicable to uh, to just about any other North American city with, uh, with a lot of car dependency and a lot of leaky buildings. But for us too, being um, such a, a northern city, um, you know, our temperature range is 75 degrees Celsius from uh, the, the heights of summer to the depths of a long winter. And so it's all the more important that, and we've developed considerable expertise around high performing buildings. We have the largest number of net zero residential homes in Canada here and, and a lot of industry expertise and a lot of technical expertise at our university in a, in a school of building science that I think is going to be massively relevant as we look to make this energy shift and figure out how to, again, optimize not just new building construction, but as our federal government announced ambitious commitments around energy retrofit incentives as part of a, a reboot of our economy in light of COVID. Um, there's a huge opportunity for relevance of uh, our technical acumen uh, and application of our experience uh, to to Canadian and North American um, building markets. And so I see that as part of our community's economic future right now, which otherwise looks fairly bleak in light of COVID and the world shifting away from uh, the energy products we've traditionally produced here. Great, thank you. Eckhart, maybe to jump to you, um, I, I definitely want to hear about your experience in your city, but maybe just to start uh, with your leadership on the, the board of the Global Covenant of Mayors and also the Covenant of Mayors in Europe. Um, can you talk about the importance of this partnership that we have with Google? Yeah, first of all, I uh, wanted to mention that it's very important that uh, we work closer together on the international scale. Of course, there are a lot of cities uh, like Edmonton, Heidelberg and lots of other cities who are taking a lead position in their countries. But we need more. We need really a movement of political leaders on the 
cities level. Or uh, I think that's exactly what we need because we noticed that on a national level, there is mostly a lack of a willingness or strengthness to believe in the Paris, Paris Agreement and really to drive the community into a CO2 neutral city to be more sustainable and to define a way for the future. I think that's very important because we don't only want to save energy or reduce CO2 reductions. We wanted to create a better world. So a good economic situation, a welfare situation for everybody, for poor, for handicapped people, for everybody to live in our country as they want. But to do so, uh, we really need leadership. And that's exactly why we're working so close together with the government of mayors, with a self-commitment. Yes, we wanted to become CO2 neutral in Heidelberg in uh, 10 years, 2030. That's our mission. That's our goal. And it's a heavy goal, really a heavy goal. So we decided 10 years ago just to build 100% CO2 neutral city areas, new city areas, since 10 years. Uh, we have a mobility where 80% nearly of the people in our city, in my city, are using bike, go per pedestrian, or uses buses. So 80%, 20% are using cars. So we reach already a very high level of target, but we don't reach the Kyoto targets or the Paris Agreement targets. And that shows you there is still a long way. So we need more qualified data. I think that's very important to focus more in the political debate on the right decisions because it's all about money and uh, when you see the situation in germany or in some other european ci uh, cities uh, we have a very big responsibility so i'm the head of the energy utility i serve all the citizens with energy with gas with electricity with long distance heating network um, I run the whole bus fleet, I run the whole tram fleet, it's our company. So if we drive uh, in one or the other direction more to fossil fuel free cars, to uh, to gas buses or anybody, uh, anything else, uh, we can change a lot. But we still didn't achieve the goals. That's always the point where I come to the Google Corporation. We need more, especially for the traffic sector. And therefore, we noticed that in the past, we use our, uh, what you call, the real data. So I know all the consumption of my citizens in detail because I serve them with electricity. I know the kilowatt hour. Uh, so uh, we are very focused there. We can support them with money. We can su support them with a clear retrofitting program for their building because we know how old the building is. But we, what we didn't have is, for, for example, for the solar use, uh, the solar audience, uh, and therefore the Google Corporation is perfect because you go, you get a very quick overview for everybody what they can do on their roof by using thermal or PV uh, to produce electricity. So very easy. Look at this. Here's the money from the city, and it comes together. On the other hand, traffic. I think this is really the biggest point. We have no real data about our traffic situation. Of course, we have our accounting um, stations, but it's not very, uh, not very detailed data what we got there. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the Google data are much more specific, much more detailed, and helps us really to define the way how we can steer the, uh, the traffic situation actually, and not in one year or in half a year, which is very important for us to use such a system. And also what Don already mentioned uh, for the uh, political debate later on, every two years, we give a report to the city council where we are, where we wanted to go, and therefore we need more exact uh, data than we have it at the moment. So we know this program is very good, very efficient, but not how efficient. So therefore, I think this cooperation can help us a lot. And on the other hand, I also have to say, not every uh, city is able to use so many data. So we have also a lot of rural areas uh, and cities in other countries who have no access to this energy supply data. We have no access uh, uh, to other data and they need maybe more than we, this uh, access to 
data, for example, from Google. So a wonderful cooperation. Many thanks for this great support. Great, thank you. And, and just a quick uh, follow up. Uh, you mentioned the very, very ambitious goal that Heidelberg has to, to achieve in, in 10 years. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you are already using the data that you do have to track your progress in, in meeting that ambitious goal? So, so the whole, the full uh, climate action program in Heidelberg is based on data. Uh, on our own data and more and more open data and more and more data uh, like so from, uh, from Google. That's exactly what we wanted to specify more our programs to get a better, more detailed uh, account uh, to the database. And uh, EIE, for example, is, uh, is, 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 is a perfect tool. Yeah, uh, it's, it's in some areas not yeah, a little bit less uh, accurate when you have the real data, but do you really have the real data? And it costs you more money, it takes more, it takes longer. So use them uh, in between to have a quick access to the customers or to the citizens. Uh, and this helps a lot. And I think this is the great new perspective. Also, uh, what I like is uh, the, the imaging. So you have a, a map imaging your potential. So it has something to do with getting people aware about their potential. It's not only about the data. So maps are wonderful, which you then have in your uh, communication strategy, where you can do something, what you can do. And if this is accessible for everybody, this is uh, wonderful. Like we have, for example, a, a new app for handicapped people where they know where to go from A to B and which is the shortest way. So it's all about new digital uh, potentials, and we also new, uh, need this in the database for our CO2 reduction programs. Great. So, Nithya, I want to uh, come to you now. We've we've heard now from uh, two leading cities, but with very different profiles. So you heard about a very car-dependent city. You heard about an almost um, on their way to almost being car-free. 80% is amazing. Uh, so congratulations on that and their um, But Nithya, I mean, how, how are you thinking about the uh, how Google is working to help um, advance these types of um, commitments as it relates to your own uh, engagement? Sure, and, and thank you. I echo Amanda's thanks for both mayors sharing their thoughts with us. Um, so when Google launched EIE, Environmental Insights Explorer, in 2018, in partnership with GCOM, it was really a simple notion. The same best-in-class maps and imagery data that is used for cityscapes and helping people get from point A to point B uh, can be used to calculate carbon emissions from buildings, from transportation, and um, as Mayor Heidelberg just said, detect solar potential and much more. But when we began talking to cities, it was clear that we were trying to chart out what is the you know, end-to-end -end climate action journey. And you might have different phrases for this, but we kind of put it in the buckets of, well, you first need to know your baseline. You first need to measure and say, where are we? Um, and identify what are your problem areas. Then you get to planning and different interventions and really understand which plans do you really want to fund. And then you actually get to acting, whether it's policy making or programs or incentives. And what became clear in terms of where Google could really help, uh, sort of echoing you know, Edmonton and Don's idea that we want to democratize those are fundamental principles, just like Google has done that for search and other places, really felt like it was our obligation to democratize any kind of maps data that can be deployed for climate action. So really making sure that we are unblocking some of those painful first few steps where uh, cities and mayors uh, don't feel like they have a long path ahead of them, a costly, time-consuming path. And sometimes by the time you've done that inventory, is it even timely? Is it even actionable? So the data that we have is really started with five cities, then 120. And to answer your um, question directly, Amanda, our commitment um, is really for the next decade of action, starting now, right away, with scaling to 3,000 cities. And it's not just data. The idea is how do we really make it actionable? So, um, you know, it feels like uh, the mayors did some of my job for me, but just to reiterate, 
Uh, the 3,000 cities have access to solar potential data from taking our high resolution imagery to build 3D models that can calculate roof geometry measurements on a per building basis. So you have a really good accurate assessment of what is your potential, just potential alone. And sometimes this can be eye opening because you realize that you have a small percent of solar array installations compared to what your real potential may be. Uh, so city of Houston, for instance, earlier this year was able to accurately assess that. Um, and they set a yearly goal of 5 million megawatt hours of solar energy uh, based on this. This has not only helped with renewables, of course, but the biggest topic on everyone's mind right now outside of COVID and health is what that has done to so many economies. So happily, you know, solar and renewable programs in Houston, they estimate at least over a thousand jobs and really rich potential for a workforce development. Um, the mayor Heidelberg of Heidelberg also talked about how transport and traffic data can be uh, really tough. And this is where we have seen some of the processes can be fairly time consuming and maps activity data is really a secret sauce that we have. So we've used that to um, apply map machine learning so you can understand not just your transport emissions, but really at a more granular level, mobility emissions. What are the modes? Um, so EIE splits it up by passenger vehicles, single passenger vehicles, bikes, walking, um, and outside of, you know, um, Heidelberg, you may not be surprised to hear that bulk of large cities emissions come from single passenger vehicles. So this is ripe for mode shifting or really thinking about where do we have green infrastructure opportunity? Should we be putting bike lanes and should we be really thinking about single passenger vehicles that are on a daily basis traveling just a few miles? And that is much easier from an intervention perspective. Or if you have an ambitious electric vehicle program, how do you think about that and installing charging stations? Um, so looking at transport, that has become very apparent to us that a lot of cities come to us saying that by the time we get our transportation emissions data, um, we're not even sure how, what is the exact intervention that we're going to make. Um, and so we're really excited that this mode splits can be much more granular than what can be found otherwise. Um, and what another learning we had in 2019 and half of 2020 is that we had about 120 cities, but we want to make sure that cities have a private login um, and can test this data, play around with it and give us real time feedback. Um, I, we completely recognize that cities have their own processes. They have long histories of collecting baseline inventory. Some of it they may accurately feel is uh, much more dependable and reliable. What we're really trying to solve for is make sure that there's some amount of instant access. And if that is calibrating well with what cities are uh, feeling directionally makes sense for their city, then that's a win-win for both Google and that city. So they can go in, we have a private tester site, play around with it, and even give us feedback if they feel like some of the ways that we uh, could be bettering our calculations. And so we're really looking forward to this two-way dialogue with cities as we improve EIE, and we really want to make sure that it is useful. Um, so the big sort of Google announcements I hope that everybody saw last year was Google really committing as a company uh, to this next decade of action uh, by 2030 and beyond. And um, it's not surprising the 2030 number has been you know, set by the Paris Accord and IPCC, et cetera. And it's really inspiring to see uh, Heidelberg and the C40 fossil fuel free cities by 2030 declaration. Looks like you're well on your way there. Edmonton's deadline for power, powering all of its renewable uh, operations with the renewables. So that looking at that is really inspiring for a company like Google to say, we're right there with you. We want to be committed to this next decade of action because we know that um, as ambitious as those goals are, the urgency has never been more. And how do we do that to make sure that we are really enabling the ecosystem? So data and insights is one thing, but we are definitely not doing this alone. There's a whole ecosystem 
of city networks and partners, GCOM, of course, being our pioneering partner, but there are NGOs, consultants, local government convening bodies that are already working with cities that are really the true domain climate change experts. And many of them have their own climate action tools and cities are using those that is part of their workflow. So we really took a second step this year with our data and insights to say, you can come to EIE, you can come to our private tester site, but we're also piloting a couple of new partnerships with ICLEI, uh, who I'm sure most of you may have heard of, and Ironbark in Australia. Ironbark, for instance, has a great tool called Snapshot, where cities, actually in Australia, uh, they call them councils, uh, they publish their greenhouse gas inventory in that tool. And our transport data, as I just described, split up by mode shows up there for about 100 Australian councils. So we're really excited now to say, okay, first we scaled our data to 3,000 cities. And that is the part about Google aiming to democratize and automate emission measurement to the extent we can, and we want to do more here. But second, we'd really like to continue to work hand in hand with partners, partners that really understand the space and have already been doing so much. So what role can Google play to really strengthen the ecosystem as well? Great. Thank, thanks so much, Nithya. And I, I, you know, I think one of the reasons we were so excited to announce the, the partnership with Google and around the Environmental Insights Explorer is because uh, there are so many cities that do struggle to have access to, to good data. Um, but we also, uh, I think, have found in our work with you and the, and the team there that there are other areas beyond what is currently um, considered in EIE where there might be potential to bring in uh, data and other types of insights from the broader Google spectrum. So really a question for the, the panel, um, but maybe I'll, I'll start with um, Don and then we can go around. But uh, thinking about the Google and, and the Global Covenant of Mayors partnership, what is the most exciting or where do you see the most potential for that to grow? Well, I think the focus around renewables and rooftops is is really appealing to us because we know that we're going to need to change our energy mix pretty aggressively. And uh, our philosophy on energy transition is one of market transformation. But to achieve market transformation, which is all about scaling rapidly to get to these ambitious goals we've all agreed globally we need to achieve, uh, you need a variety of different things to go right. Um, of course, you need regulatory pushes, but you also need incentives, you need market capacity to grow, um, and you need the consumer to be educated. Uh, and then you need financing vehicles to bring those future benefits forward and all the right price signals. So it's a it's a huge and coordinated effort, and, and we're always working closely with the federal government to, to try to design that to actually set off this uh, economic boom in renewables. But fundamentally, uh, one of the tools that uh, that we need to be able to give to consumers to make those decisions about their own homes uh, is information about um, uh, the potential of that home. And so uh, working with MyHeat, which is an Alberta company, we're really grateful that Google was also able to help map the solar potential of um, of just about every roof here in the city. Um, and uh, and we're grateful to have been the first Canadian city to do that. One of the things about solar that uh, doesn't often get talked about in other parts of the world is that even though our uh, nights are long in the winter time here, when it's cold in the summertime, solar panels being a semiconductor, um, uh, they produce way, way beyond their manufacturer rated output when it's minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. And so even on the short days, you can get quite a bit of juice. Uh, out of a solar panel on a roof, provided you can keep the snow off it. So uh, for there's the winter city applications uh, to a lot of this technology that we're interested to help accelerate mass adoption of. And, and really the point about scaling here, and, and I appreciate Google's ambition, and it's the whole premise of having a global network like GCOM and ICLE and C40 and all of the other actors in this, uh, uh, likewise, uh, the Partners for Climate Protection uh, within Canada as part of our Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Well, the cities are in a position, particularly the larger cities, to template a lot of this and then 
just in my own metropolitan region here, I've got 10 more jurisdictions between 5,000 and 90,000 people who may not have the capacity to figure all of this out at the city scale, but making um, these kinds of tools available and scalable, even just so our neighboring jurisdictions can say, we wanna go in the same direction. That's how we tip this over 10X again, which is the kind of mass adoption that we're going to need in order to achieve our goals. And frankly, I've got to figure out also how to make it easy for my neighbors so that I don't price myself out of a competitive marketplace and just chase the lower performing buildings across the border into the county. So making this really, really easy for all jurisdictions to, to come along with and then making it easier in turn for the federal government to raise the regulatory floor for uh, building performance uh, and also align the incentive networks both through carbon pricing but also uh, uh, on on the financing side through pace loans and and such uh, so that it just gets easier and easier and easier becomes a no-brainer for people to um, take advantage of that uh, solar potential, for example. So for me, this is all about scaling across municipal networks into smaller and rural communities as as Eckhart mentioned, the need to, really uh, take some leadership and then support mass adoption around us uh, not hoard any of this knowledge and any of this progress but make sure that it becomes widespread so that we can all get to the goals that that we share and Eckhart, uh, it's really same question for you do you do you see a similar opportunity as don's just described in terms of scale or what what to you is the most exciting opportunity with this partnership I think the, uh, what Don said is exactly right. We're, uh, we're, I think we're believing the same uh, strategy. For me, it's uh, the absolutely biggest political issue is uh, we give uh, the citizens the potential to act now. It's exactly what we're talking. I had about, uh, before the corona crisis, I had more than 15,000 young people on the street uh, we have to fight much stronger for uh, for our CO two reduction programs, and we all in the uh, in the boards and the directors and the mayors. We said yes, we have done for so many years so many good things, but we didn't achieve the targets. So we are all in this situation, and uh, through such a database, we give everybody immediately the potential. Okay, it's not about us. Uh, the municipality, the city, it's about us all. So everybody can act now. I think this is the big mission. Just use your laptop, you get all the information. You can do it and you don't have to wait for the mayor. And we as mayors, we said, we don't have to wait for the national government because mostly this dependency in the past led to a downgrading of our activities. And now you have a boom from the ground floor because you just can use the data and then you also find us, uh, the subsidy programs, the supporting programs from the national or from the local side. But first of all, you have to be catched. You have to be attracted. Yeah. And you have to be visible, uh, uh, yeah, uh, integrated into this potential. So you can see the potential yeah, about the status. And I think it's very important in this field to have the imaging, uh, the imaging uh, structure. It, it's not just data. They're a little bit rough. You have to image it, the data, and then you uh, get the kick into the people to move in this direction. It's exactly what we need it because we need everybody. And as I mentioned before, the biggest point is really the traffic uh, and changing a behavior of people. When you're a commuter, you have a, a cheaper house far outside the downtown area and you have to commute. Sometimes you don't want to commute, but you have to commute and now to get a stronger commitment to climate and use now mass transport systems like buses and trains, which were sometimes not existing, uh, or uh, bicycle highways. Uh, this brings you to the point, yes, I have to, and I have to force uh, the politicians on the local side to give us stronger support to change our commuter uh, strategy into a more environmental friendly way. I think therefore the data is perfect and very important. 
Right. And um, Nithya, I think you can tell there's some fans here for the for the work that Google is doing and, and for the partnership. But curious to hear from you, um, what what is the, the most important for you in terms of the, the Google and the Global Covenant of Mayors partnership that we've established? Really, for us, it gives us a very frank, honest assessment of what cities need um, and not being data and tech happy and assuming that it, you know, just whatever we put out will be useful and actionable. We really want to understand where cities are coming from. And we also, I heard, I heard um, uh, Eckhart say, you know, there are more cities, there are others, these are leaders that are even more underserved and really have constraints. So without, you know, rose colored glasses, because unfortunately we can't afford those during the times that we live in, um, GCOM has been very, very useful for us and really understanding what are the problems we are best suited to solve, where are the constraints, and who are we solving them for? So really being laser focused on making sure that this is a problem that is worth solving and Google is the one to solve it. Um, we are not kidding ourselves that there are so many other constraints that cities uh, face, everything from political will to financial constraints to, frankly, right now uh, in a time of COVID. And we really appreciated GCOM's honest feedback on what is happening in the global south, the biggest emitters and their challenges. And it really edges us on to ensure that we are understanding where our strong suits lie, where are our data uh, strengths and where are data gaps? Because I can take that back to our product and engineering teams and say, this is really where we can meet cities where they are. This is what sustainability officers really need. By the way, these are the cities that don't have sustainability officers and we need to actually plug that gap. Um, so the most exciting for me is, first of all, a 25x um, increase in scale of cities and data access um, was was kind of a huge leap for us, uh, but it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gotten that early feedback that yes, you're onto something here. And there are some parts of our data that are more, more useful than others for some cities. But what we really want to ensure is we're listening, um, that we are meeting cities where they are, and that we're keeping up with the latest policies and incentives that mayors and their sustainability officers want to implement. That's where we can make sure that there is a fit between what we're looking to offer and what we bring to bear for the cities. Great. So um, Don and Eckhart, you've just heard that Google is listening, which is, is fantastic to hear. But uh, given that uh, we are in this very strange time, you've both mentioned uh, where we are with COVID. The world has changed dramatically. The focus on climate has also had to, had to change and become a more integrated and equitable approach, uh, which I know is also a priority for both of you in your cities. But given um, what we've heard here, are there additional insights that you think could be made available either through a tool like EIE or in partnership with Google? And maybe Eckhart, I'll go to you first this time. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think there are a lot of uh, details what we can uh, change. Uh, Nitya just mentioned they're just uh, wanted to work together with the cities, listening to the cities and trying to optimize their programs. Sometimes we as cities don't know which data is available. Yeah, uh, and therefore it's very important that we work on a on a on a on, on a clear basic together. So the first move is to have the clear uh, exchange of experience. What we can get, which data you have, at what time when available, uh, which technical solutions we need to use it. Because what we don't want is just data. The data itself is not very efficient. You have to create a, a framework of, of imagination of the, the data for special tools. So that's what we're working for. Yeah. If the map is not attractive, the solar map in your city is not attractive, you have to, we have to work on it. Yeah. Uh, thinking about uh, wind speed, yeah. Uh, does your city uh, has interesting fields of uh, wind power plan possibilities? Use it. Does your city has 
uh, special hotspots of uh, energy consumption, which is not based on housing, maybe on industry, use it. So all these specific focuses are, are coming up in the future, in my opinion. At the moment, we're a little bit general about the citizens and the information to the citizens, but it should be in the future more based on specific consumers, uh, which helps a lot in these cases. And uh, I think this is uh, something where we have to work on it. And uh, I think this will be also the future. And of course, uh, how quickly we get the data. So make it easy and affordable. Uh, and also taking into account that uh, data security is uh, really existing, which is also for us extremely important because we all have the fear. When I look to my colleagues, for example, the two cities uh, in Germany, they had a total shutdown by hackers. Uh, we have the medical clinic, the biggest one in Dusseldorf, who had at the moment a shutdown. Uh, I think about 15, 20 people were dying because the data is where uh, the, the uh, the, the IT system was not secured. So uh, this is a very important point to bring other colleagues and partners on board and to say, yes, we have tested it, it's safe, we can secure this and then do it. I think uh, lots of detailed questions are coming up, by, but I think this is exactly what we want to achieve in the program for the rest of the GCOM members. Great, and, and Don, maybe to jump to you, same question. Edmonton is surely different in a time of COVID than it than it was before, um, but are there different or new insights that you could imagine here? Well, it's it seems like, uh, you know, crises arrive uh, not alone, but layered. And I mean, we've had uh, an environmental crisis, both of emissions and also of mass extinction and natural systems that are in decline. And that's that's a compound crisis. So uh, we've done a lot of work around biodiversity here, and we believe that that uh, uh, nature is being impacted and also nature needs to be part of the solution. So I think understanding those natural systems at the local scale where people can relate to nature and, and feel passionate about it. And then, you know, almost Google Earth style, zoom out to understand how that adds up to a healthy planet. Uh, or an unhealthy planet, uh, because I think people have some at least level of anxiety increasingly because of uh, the conversation about uh, that our planetary system is beginning to falter and that its failure would represent our failure. So that is then also a, a time of considerable anxiety and uncertainty. And we see that and hear that from our youth. And it's also a time of uh, where, where inequity, where racism, uh, at the systemic level, uh, impacts of colonization, which we see here in Canada with our indigenous peoples. So those those issues of, of equity and inclusion are also front and center uh, after what's happened in the United States and the conversations that have spread around the world around policing reform, but also systemic racism underlying it. And so you've got this confluence of this public health crisis, uh, this environmental crisis, uh, this, this equity uh, crisis that is long standing but coming to the fore. And those are all uh, conditions which I hope we will look back one day and say this was a precipitous turning point in history. But rather than turning to our biases and our basest instincts, we turned to each other with curiosity, armed with information that allowed us to raise the level of debate and solve multiple issues at once through job creation. Um, through addressing energy issues in rural and remote First Nations communities in our country, for example, as a not only an economic measure and not only an environmental measure, but an equity measure. So we really need to learn uh, how to visualize and integrate the need and the integrated opportunity uh, for a bolder response to COVID than just trying to claw our way back to a normal before that our young people are telling us and our black indigenous and people of color are telling this wasn't good for them before and now having been overexposed in this public health crisis uh, to the inequitable consequences of the the economic challenges um, are we now have likewise in our city uh, young people literally in the streets demanding better for climate for equity and um, 
And behind all of that is a huge economic insecurity. And so we need to be able to articulate at the very local scale and at the planetary scale, a hopeful version of the future. That's the leadership challenge for, for everybody. But uh, two things about working in networks like this. One, it's very helpful, obviously, for me to say, well, I'm not just, you know, as kooky mayor talking about climate change who's out of step with, you know, my community that doesn't want to talk about these issues. I can say, I've got 10,000 friends around the world and we're all checking in with each other, making sure, okay, we're not crazy. This is, this is a real thing and there's a real issue and there's a lot of opportunity and we're not alone in trying to rise to this challenge. And then likewise, having uh, partners like Google provide additional external validation. So rather than um, uh, voices of, hesitation here let's call them politely and out in edmonton saying well we shouldn't be talking about these solar panels and we shouldn't be wasting time on these on these initiatives it's a little bit harder for those kinds of voices to to discount um, what we're trying to do in our cities when you have ten thousand mayors and you've got uh you know techno philanthropy coming to the table with mike bloomberg's help uh, and with Google's help, um, that helps land these with uh, broader resonance and credibility, uh, which is very, very helpful politically, quite frankly, uh, to, to help us then get these questions of building economic hope and equity hope and environmental hope back into our public discourse at a time where, sadly, for a variety of reasons before COVID, uh, and then COVID's amplified this divisiveness and this polarization uh, in, in many parts of the world. And these kinds of initiatives are something we can point to, to say, no, we're still laser focused on, on these transformational challenges, which are also massive opportunities to improve equity, uh, improve economic performance, uh, and, uh, and achieve these environmental goals and maintain our planetary systems that we depend on. Great. Well, Nithya, um, you've just heard from some some very interesting and specific examples. And I, as we close out our conversation today, we'd just love to ask you, um, how how do you think Google can help to respond to some of these opportunities? And, and specifically, how are you thinking about making EIE data more accessible? Um, sure. So firstly, it was just really great to hear all of the ways that we could be expanding and making, um, like um, Eckhart said, um, it's called Environmental Insights Explorer for a reason. Data in itself is just overwhelming and not that actionable. But how do we make it really insightful has always been our premise and we'll continue to hold ourselves to a high bar there. Um, it's I would like to continue to think that we are going to have a three-pronged approach to make sure that um, EIE, but our all of our work with cities, um, is really robust and well-rounded. The first is, of course, data, tech, and innovation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some newer things that we're thinking about that hopefully will resonate with some of the previous com uh, comments. Second is continuing to really uh, strengthen and bolster the partner ecosystem and work very closely with partners such as yourself, Amanda, but many more uh, that we know exist uh, around the world. And lastly, really making sure that we're being thoughtful about funding, sometimes to create um, these best practices, to create a halo effect and create some role modeling. It's important to make sure that um, cities have um, just something more to jumpstart their action. Um, the last one on funding, I'm excited to say that last fall, we partnered uh, with Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy arm, and we called it our action fund for climate action, of course, to say, okay, EIE and, and insights are great, but there's also a need for capital investment to fund critical resources and capacity to accelerate city programs. So we launched this fund. It's a four million action fund to support civil society organizations, academic institutions, and nonprofits. And we're excited that in a year or less, we have gotten bunches of applications and some of our first grants are being facilitated by the fantastic work of ICLE in places like Guadalajara, where they're putting action funding to work looking at the electrification of bus fleets and optimization of transit routes and schedules. So I'm so excited to see who's going to watch Guadalajara and say, oh, you know, if they can do that, so can we, and really start creating a ripple effect 
uh, of successes, even in cities um, in the global south. Coming back to how can we expand EIE and how can we make this um, even more robust, knowing that technology can help help city civic leaders, not just with climate action, but with resiliency and economic prosperity. Uh, that's never been more true than the world we live in today. Uh, cities have a lot of competing priorities. And the more we can make climate action, not as opposed to, but hand in hand with economic recovery, public health, societal benefits, equity, the much better our messages are going to resonate. Some of the examples we're thinking about are our air quality work. Air quality has you know, always been in the news, but never got this top of mind sort of visceral awareness from citizens everywhere until NASA published those before after pictures of big cities where suddenly the skylines were beautiful uh, without any traffic on the streets. While that's an that's a unfortunate accident of COVID, lots of cities said, well, yes, of course we want to recover, but we don't want to go back to those baselines. So we are really working on air quality, understanding how hyperlocal mapping can help cities. And we've already started with cities like London and Copenhagen who are creating low emission zones. Um, another one we know is that Climate action has to go hand in hand with jobs. Uh, the green recovery from in the EU stimulus bill is an excellent example of really translating energy transitions to green jobs so that this is really a tide that lifts all boats. And ultimately, you know, um, Don talked about nature and biodiversity. And that's something that Google has extraordinary tools in terms of looking at uh, deforestation and th that kind of monitoring. But even from a city perspective, you can start looking at urban tree cover to mitigate heat islands. So all in all, I'm really optimistic that we can continue on all three sides, making sure that there's freely accessible insights on climate action strong partnerships with cities and city partners, a good set of knowledge exchange, what we have to offer and what's really going to be useful, and ultimately investment with capital where we can jumpstart action. Hopefully that is going to generate greener, healthier, much more economically prosperous future for cities. Great. Um, well, I think we can all agree that there has both been great progress uh, and insights already developed through this partnership and definitely potential for it to grow in the, in the future. I want to thank uh, all of the panelists for joining us today, especially the two mayors who are taking time out of the very busy work of uh, governing a city to join us. Uh, so thanks, everyone. And thanks to all of you who joined us for this conversation. Mm -hmm.